98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neen, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. Now, we are very, very pleased to welcome back to the show um, an old friend, and uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly the many ways that we could introduce him, but um, let me just say good evening and welcome to Geoffrey Archer. Lovely to be back on the show. Very, very welcome. Now, um, uh, are you keeping well? And um, lockdown has been uh, safe for you? Have you, have well, you been keeping? I mean, lockdown was not pleasant for anybody, but um, ironically, it meant that, that I could write for 144 days in a row, six hours a day, it got up 900 hours of writing, and I walked for three hours a day, so I did 500 hours, sorry, 500 miles of walking. So I occupied myself fully, and my, my sympathy and my worries are for those people who have jobs or occupations that you just cannot do anything about during COVID. So, COVID. so uh, restaurants had such a terrible time, small businesses had such a terrible time, and there are people who just couldn't conduct their business. And for them, I felt very sorry indeed. And on top of that, the young. The 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 20. But what they are going through, it's going to take 10 years for them to fully recover. One, academically, and two, financially. This has been a terrible period. Now, when, when I spoke to you at Christmas time, um, you were, I think you were heading off down to the gym. Um, you, you still, you still keeping yourself fit? Very much indeed. I spend um, a, couple of, a couple of hours a week in the gym. I've had the same trainer now for 15 years. She's a vicious woman. <laughs> and she, and she has a, a wonderful routine. I do, at my age, I'm 80 now. Yes. She does. Um, I do 20 minutes cardiovascular, 20 minutes weights, and 20 minutes stretching. And she makes me walk. On top of that, today I've done, I'm looking at my thing, I've done 9,618 steps. And I have to do 10,000 every day. I do about 10 minutes stretching and then I get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a complete layabout. <laughs> yes. You are a waste of time and a layabout. It's amazing if anybody watches, listens to this program. Well, no. they on it. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned that you've turned 80. And uh, just before the break, we were talking about someone else who's just turned 80. So, Jeffrey Boycott. Yes. Um, and, and indeed, Cliff Richard as well. Um, oh, dear Cliff, who I've known for years. What a, a truly nice man. Decent, nice man. Yeah, he's not a cricket fan, though, is he? From, from no, the, he has another poor thing. <laughs> Semi-educated. You can't really go through life without cricket. I mean, it's just disgraceful. And, and Mr. Boycott, do you have any... Uh any anecdotes about him? No, I've never, I've never known um, Sir Geoffrey. I've never known him. I've, I've known a lot of your Essex lads. I know uh, Alistair Cook, damn him. <laughs> and I knew uh, uh, Graham Gooch, damn him. <laughs> and I knew uh, Douglas uh, Insult, damn him. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Somerset have had a lot of trouble at the hands of Essex over the years. Uh, now you lead me on very nicely. So, um, when you were very kindly one of our sponsors when we first started up on this hovel of a cricket show um, in 2019, um, and when you appeared, we were talking about it was just before the season's the county championship climax down at Taunton, where Taunton exactly where it was, I was there, my dear, with your friend John Cleese as I well, was with the two of us sitting there in the rain. A couple of bloody idiots. <laughs> and then the Essex, the Essex uh, uh, chairman, a thoroughly nice individual, John uh, kept praying for rain. I mean, I didn't like the fellow at all. I thought this <laughs> was grateful to be praying for rain. No, he's a good chap. And he said, actually, said uh, very, very sincerely, he said, I'd much rather have a proper four-day game and beat you yeah. rather than this. And I agreed with him totally. Next time you see Mr. Cleese, can you ask him to... Uh, I'd started corresponding with him about appearing on this, uh, on this show, and he was interested. And, um, he, but he loves I, his cricket. I know he's he does. He's also very well informed about his cricket. He's, he's an expert on cricket. Uh, the, a passion that's gone on for many years, and his love of Somerset is beyond question. Mm. So, anyway, how did that, that game... With, 
was was ruined by the weather, as you said. Ruined by the weather, and, and the sad thing too, because you, as a, a sentimental fool that you are, mm. uh, was that it was Triscothic's last match. That's yeah. right. And it would have been nice to see him get a fifty, and the crowd, a full crowd, stand and give him a. And we had the privilege of Alistair Cook batting as well. So there were. It could have been a wonderful four days, and in the end, it was just washed out and really wasn't very exciting. So we whisk forward uh, 12 months and we're at Lord's. Oh, then you start cheating again. <laughs> <laughs> Your two-headed coin got the toss. And what a clever toss to win because you... I thought it was brave of you to put us in. I, I, I sat and thought, well, I'm surely that's a mistake. And then, of course, you genuinely beat us. A beautiful century by Alistair. Mm. Beautiful. That man likes the big occasion, he doesn't does. he? He does. He does. He, he'll, he'll rise to the big occasion, that one. He's a genuinely great opening batsman. I mean, arguably the greatest opening batsman, uh, uh, English opening batsman, probably the greatest opening batsman I've seen in my lifetime. Do you think he retired too early? Well, I talked to him about that. And he said he thought, it's very, well, listen, I'm saying nothing new that he hasn't said to everyone else. He said he thought there, had, there came, comes a time, Jeffrey, when it's sensible to go. And he told me then that he wanted to do three years with Essex. And he appears to have done two of them. And I said I'd recommended no years with Essex. <laughs> not a good move. I said I thought you should get back to the farm now, Alistair. Start <laughs> digging the potatoes out and shove off. And the bloody man didn't take any notice of me at all. Result that he beat Somerset nearly single-handed. And his mother-in-law, who is a devoted fan, will not be getting her free book. <laughs> He's quite interesting. I've been down to his farm, and, and when you see him there, you wouldn't have thought he does anything else. It's, it, it's quite amazing. You, well, it's because he's a very genuinely decent, modest man. If you met him just casually, you would not know he'd captain England. You would not know he'd scored more runs than any other batsman in English history. And you would not know the records he has broken. As if He's a genuinely... Uh, in my lifetime in cricket, I've met many of them, to be fair. A, a Flintoff has the same qualities, the same gift of making you giggle with him rather than uh, uh, realize you're in the, uh, in the presence of, of one of the great cricketers. And of course, with Alistair Cook, you are in the presence of one of the great cricketers. That's a very interesting comparison because mm. to look at them and to see them in the public eye, you wouldn't think that they could be at all compared. Well, funnily enough, they're both, they have both, it's very interesting that, they're both incredibly modest and incredibly nice. Uh, I, I've, I've been very privileged over the years to meet uh, most of the great cricketers. What won't surprise you is when they go on tour, many of them uh, have hours and hours on their own and they read a lot. So I've met half, uh, half of most of the great teams. Um, and the other half, their wives are readers. So <laughs> I remember Cumbly coming up to me in an airport. I, I felt guilty because I didn't recognize him. And someone whispered, the <laughs> captain of India is heading towards you. And I, so I said, and he said, I've got my wife on the phone and she'd like to speak to you. <laughs> and he, the devil, never read a word. Poor thing. <laughs> and she, waiting desperately for the next book. Whereas VBS Laxman, Raoul Dravid, and Sachin Tendulkar genuinely chatted to me about the books. And indeed, I told him that I wanted to be the captain of the England cricket team. <laughs> what was very kind is Mr. Sunil Gavaskar, who's been a friend for many years, dear man, average batsman, but a dear man. <laughs> he said to me, he said on television when we were being interviewed together as two of the great cricketers of our time, <laughs> he said quite openly that he felt I should captain the England cricket team, that many people in India felt I should captain in the England cricket team, which was extremely kind of him, extremely kind of him. Well, I think you are recognised because I put on our social media this morning that Jay Archer was appearing tonight, and I think we've got our highest listening figures ever, although I'm getting all kinds of abuse now by about saying... About fast bowling, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got the phone call. I have to tell you, I got the phone call, and I said, yes, I was available. <laughs> I wasn't very fast at the moment. I said, at 80, I wasn't really very fast. <laughs> but um, I was available and very happy to captain in the side. I felt that captaincy was my strength. And that, uh, I, I once did a speech in uh, Yorkshire to celebrate 
uh, uh, Len Hutton's 100th birthday, but uh, 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 celebrate the day on which Len Hutton was born in, uh, 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 in Leeds at the Great Ground. And I did it with Michael Brealey in, in one of the one of the crueler moments, because I think he again is mm. a, a lovely human being. He, I said, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be captain of the England cricket team. One of the major disadvantages was that I couldn't bat, bowl, or field. Uh, and to which <laughs> someone in the audience said, "Ah, lad, it never worried Brealey." <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, th- he was the thinking captain, wasn't oh, he? A great captain. Yeah, a he great was. Great captain. There were matches that he literally won where he fooled the Australian captain, completely saw him off, poor devil. He didn't realise he was in the presence of a man who got a first-class honours degree from Cambridge. <laughs> he, he underestimated yeah. him. Great man, Michael Brady, great man. Well, you're not such a bad man yourself, um, Lord Archer. Yes, kind of you to say so, sir. A man of many, many talents. And um, one of the ones that I always um, think is underestimated or overlooked when people think of the name Geoffrey Archer is your ability, and this is where your and I paths first crossed, uh, was at, uh, at various charity dinners where you have been a rather splendid auctioneer raising raising money where probably other people wouldn't have raised it. And um, I'm assuming that um, your talents on the auctioneering oh, circuit it's, have been missed. so sad. I'm getting a lot of letters at the moment saying, are you available next October? Mm. You're quite right. It's my hobby and I love it. And indeed, it's the way I've met many cricketers. Yeah. In my lifetime, I've raised just under 60 million for wow. different charities. Wow. And it's been thrilling. It's my hobby and I enjoy it. And I repeat, it's been the, a privilege to do it for many cricket clubs or different charities. And yes, I miss it. And during, I haven't done an... My last auction was for the Prince of Wales at uh, the Mansion House for... Now, this you won't believe because, of course, COVID is now the big thing, for the Australian fires. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And the High Commissioner asked me if I'd do the auction. Uh, Prince Charles was the main guest, if I'd do the auction. And it was the last function he went to and the last function I went to. Two days later, Mary and I were down in Cambridge, and heaven knows where he was, but he, poor thing, had it. So they rang me up and said, were you at the same table? I said, Mary was, yeah, Mary and I were on the same table. He said, well, he's got it. You'd better Mm. check yourself. So, uh, but luckily we, we so far sailed through. Now, he didn't inherit his... His father's a big cricket fan. Um, yes. And... Uh, God you know, man for the... For the Taverners, isn't he? And, yeah, and, God and, man for the Taverners. Yeah. God bless him. That's right. But, but Charles is not so keen on cricket, I gather. I, I don't know. I don't know him well enough to know uh, whether he is or isn't. We haven't had a member of the royal family for some time mm. who I would call was a nutter like me or you. <laughs> Actually, I'm a gentle nutter. You're a complete... <laughs> Certified. Any man who could support Essex is a man who could be, uh, uh, put in a white coat immediately, I think, and not as an umpire either. I mean, just buttoned up. No, no. <laughs> yes, but well, we've had some prime ministers that have been. Um, oh, John Major's knowledge of the game is staggering. Yeah. And his love of the game is staggering. Yeah. Uh, I. I uh, uh, we have been, to, obviously, to many cricket matches together. And uh, I, do you remember? Do you remember a Home Secretary? I think he was a Home Secretary called Brooke, who was a uh, member of Parliament and, and a brilliant. Cabinet was that under Minister. Heath? Was it? Or? He had the greater knowledge of cricket than anyone I've ever met. Really? He would sit with John and myself, and frankly, outdo us. I would come third always in this battle because. Uh, Brooke knew the most by a long way. Peter Brooke knew the most by a long way. John, very knowledgeable, particularly about Surrey, which he had a great passion for and used to talk about. Remind me very politely and courtesy, because he's a polite and courteous man, that uh, Surrey beat uh, Somerset. Uh, Surrey were top of the county cricket table seven years in a row when Somerset were bottom of the county cricket table seven years in a row. <laughs> and, of course, that's, that's how I started my life. My life was in Western Supermare supporting Somerset. 
And I've been waiting now for 70 years for <laughs> us winning them one of the championships, please. <laughs> I'll tell you story. I thought we were going to do it. I thought we'd do it this year against Essex. I thought we'd do it last year against Essex. But I'm an eternal optimist. Well, I think it's fair to say that, that Somerset and Essex are the best two Red Bull counties um, oh, yes, now. in the game. Yes, they are. And indeed, one forgets that, that uh, uh, when I can remember in my youth when uh, Somerset had never won the county chip, neither had Essex. No. Essex mm. won it quite late. If you see the first year, they won it. They then, the blighters, won it quite often, which was tiresome of them. <laughs> but actually, they were down with us at one point. I mean, they weren't doing that that well. Yeah. And I, 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 I mean, I loved my heroes were, and liked them as human beings. I very much liked Doug Insole, who was just such a gentle, kind person. Trevor Bailey, yeah. very, very nice man. Liked him, liked him a lot. Gentleman and, cricketers. And, and, and they were a goodish side, but they didn't win it. No, no. So, away from being the best England captain we've never had, um, the best sprinter that we nearly had, actually. Um, I actually, do you know, it's very interesting you say that, and it's very kind of you to say that. <laughs> uh, the truth was, I was an also-ran. I mean, yes, I got in the British team, mm. uh, but I can tell you a story about that on one occasion, on one of my internationals, one of my few internationals, uh, where I was uh, up against England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and I was running for England. And the selectors rang me at the last minute and said, Jeffrey, uh, how, uh, I, uh, you're down at Oxford. I said, yes. We need you now. We need you in Cardiff now for the England, Ireland, Scotland. You're in the relay team. Can you get here on the next train? So I said, yes. And, and I, I had this super girlfriend called Mary, who I later married, who I <laughs> wanted to show that I'd run for England. So I brought the program back. And I, and, and I noticed that... Uh, uh, the program said uh, uh, Radford, Davis, Davis, A, N, other. I thought, <laughs> this is a great start for one's running <laughs> career, to be, to be known as A, N, other. <laughs> or A, N, cook. Yeah. Well, yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Well, of course, I, 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 I had the potential to be as good as cook. <laughs> I think... <laughs> Well, you did. You did realise your potential. I could walk down the. Sorry, yes, go on. You you, you did realise your potential in in many 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 things. You're, well, uh, I captained I captained the rest of the world. Somerset against the rest of the world, and was batting with Viv Richards, uh, <laughs> not unknown person at the other end. <laughs> I hadn't realised I'd known Viv all, all his cricketing life, and I hadn't quite realised how lazy he was. One of the laziest <laughs> lighters I've ever come around in my life. So I'm one end, and I want to run, and uh, clearly running wasn't something that Viv. Went in for it's not a Caribbean pastime. <laughs> he's what he specialised in. So I started running, and I got to the other end, and he was still there, grinning at me. <laughs> so I thought the wise thing to do was go back and be run out because I didn't think the crowd had actually come to see me. <laughs> so I returned to the pavilion in Somerset, and as I was going up the steps, an elderly gentleman looked at me and said, "Ah, my dear." was a wise decision, a wise decision, <laughs> if I may say so, because the last stoning in Taunton was in 1472. <laughs> well, what you have achieved is you have sold, I've, I did, I've been doing my research, because I know, Jeffrey, when I talk to you, I have to be on my A game, I you can't... Be. <laughs> yes, you Yes, you've sold... Um, in the region of 250 to 300 million books worldwide. Yes. Congratulations, exactly. congratulations. Well, I still, you know, you see the letters every day, the emails every day, you see, and you kind of, you, you don't ever get used to it and you don't take it for granted. I, I've been writing six hours today, I'm still flat out, the new book's out next Thursday, and I'm 80 and still loving every, I think I'll stop when I when I don't enjoy it anymore, but I get such a thrill when you get... In this morning's post was a, a letter from a 12-year-old boy in India and from a 93-year-old lady in California. So it, it, I'll, I'll never stop being thrilled and very privileged. I'm a simple storyteller. I love it, I enjoy it, and I'm very happy to have brought happiness to other people. Would I swap it for 100 at Lord's? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Well, to use a parliamentary term, and I know you're a great parliamentarian, but that's a conversation for another time, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for advanced copy of his book, which I received 
a couple of weeks back, the new book, uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, which is the second of the William Warwick... Um, is it a trilogy, this one? No, it's, each one will be an individual story, but you will see William going from, in the first book, uh, Nothing Ventured, where he was a detective sergeant in the art squad, and the book you've just got, which is Hidden in Plain Sight, he's now into drugs. The third book, which I'm writing at the moment, he's into uh, a police corruption. In the fourth book, it'll be murder. In the fifth book, the royal family. So I know where I'm going, and he will go from uh, detective constable, detective sergeant, detective, I'm, uh, detective inspector, and then detective chief. He'll go right up. And if I live long enough, he will become the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. But that will take me nine books. Each one will be an individual story, but it'll take me nine books to get him from constable on the beat right through to commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And was that always the plan before you started writing Nothing Ventured, or did it no, kind of evolve? Uh, I wrote a series called The Clifton Chronicles in which the hero, Harry Clifton, is an author. And so I was able to write a lot about my own life. Um, and his... His eponymous hero was William Warwick, a, a detective, a man whose father was a barrister, but he wanted to be a policeman, and he beats his father and joins the Metropolitan Police. And I got letters from all over the world saying, Jeffrey, we'd like to know more about William Warwick, please. So I sat and thought about it and said, wouldn't it be fun to, do, to take him from constable through to commissioner? So and really, it, it was the readers who told me that's what they wanted. There's an interesting... What I, what I like about these these books... Um, this is a two-prong question, but I like the fact that um, Nothing Ventured started in um, the early 80s, and there were lots of references, and, and, and I congratulate you on some really good research that um, timestamp um, events and scenery um, from that time. And, and, and this book, we're moving forward a few years deeper into the 80s, and I'm just sort of wondering that if we do go on to see William become commissioner, um, will, that, will that be up to date, or is that still going to be... Well, in? it's hard to say, but I'm, I'm through now where I'm writing this evening to 1988, and I'll be going into the 90s. Mm. Yes, I would think we'll certainly get into the 20s. Uh, so we might not get quite up to date, but I think we'll get near it. And because I've lived through that period, very kind of you to say that the authenticity no, of, is, of that side... But, of course, I lived through that period, so I remember it. And, uh, mind you, uh, my secretary read something I wrote the other day and said, no, they didn't, they didn't have handheld phones in those days. <laughs> so you can still make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, you st and you were, oh, God. And I said, well, when did they come out? She said, well, they came out about four years later. You're four years mm. too early. So you can make those. And readers love to write you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've uh, admired you and loved you for many years, but uh, <laughs> you don't even know what the capital of Switzerland is. <laughs> uh, yours sincerely. <laughs> or indeed, to the dear lady who wrote to me, uh, dear Lord Archer, you are without question the most devious man in England. <laughs> Would you please let me know when your next book is coming out? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I do like about your books, um, and particularly in, in both of the um, William Warwick novel so far um, is that you put little you drop little bombs in there and if you're eagle eyed you'll spot them and there's, a, there's an interesting bit where um, a couple of the detectives are just talking generally about William um, and prospects in the police and um, someone says um, by 2020 I'd, I'd be happy if we'd seen a black commissioner but lord knows not a woman <laughs> yes, that was very tempting to tease, <laughs> tease one's reader. Yeah. And, of course, we now have a commissioner of police in uh, Cressida Dick, who's, and a brilliant leader she is. Mm. I've, I've met her on three occasions uh, where I heard a lecture on one occasion where quite, quite brilliant. She's an Oxford graduate, isn't she? And, and she, I think she's oh, a master's from a Cambridge. Very, very clever woman. She yeah. could have been an Oxford don. She didn't have to go into the police force. She could have, she could have done almost anything. She's a truly, she's an all-rounder, and we're jolly lucky to have her in that position. But of course, um, I'm advised by a man called John Sutherland, Detective uh, Chief and Superintendent John Sutherland, who's now retired, 
and written a brilliant book himself on his life in the Met. And uh, uh, the more police, I've just recently been dealing with the head of the drug squad uh, because uh, book, uh, book two, the one you have, is the drug squad. Mm -hmm. So I've been head dealing with, and look, they're very impressive people. You don't become head of the drug squad. You don't become head of the art theft an antique squad if you're if you're not up to it they're very impressive people and Cressida Dick I'm I am bound to say is just she's an ace yeah an ace and, and what's impressive and I'm assuming that um, that John has, has helped you with this is the um, it seems to me that any TV something like Line of Duty for example um, but you yeah I mean it's, that's a very wonderful, wonderful series yeah it is the attention to detail there is similar to yours uh, and the love of acronyms um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they give me these all the time. These, these. Oh God! The number of times I've just stopped. It's so funny because the drugs man are you pathetic. Because I'll tell you because of the. You've just read the book, so I'll tell you about the first five pages because and how they arose. The drugs man said, "Well, I'll tell you about heroin, Jeffrey," and he told me about heroin. I'll tell you about cocaine and crack, cocaine and marijuana, and he told me about cocaine, crack, cocaine and marijuana, and I listened to him and kept it. And I, said, you know, tell me some stories. What do you mean stories? Tell me some stories. Give me some stories. And he couldn't. He was a great, great man on facts. He was fantastic on facts, but bloody useless on giving. So suddenly we're walking out of a room, and I said, well, tell me something that annoyed you. He said, oh, oh, he said, I had this burglar who I was chasing for years. He knew I was chasing him. <clears throat> I knew he knew I was chasing him. But what really annoyed me was every Christmas he'd send me a Harrods hamper, <laughs> which I had to send downstairs to collect. Miles He's not allowed to take a thing, so I sent it down. But I used to, it used, I knew it was from him, and it used to drive, and I got him by the throat. He said, you got me by the throat, Jeffrey. I said, I'm blimmin' well have. And the first five pages of Hidden in Plain Sight, the new book, is William Warwick's team with the commander sitting around a table with a Harrods hamper on the center of the <laughs> oh, table yes. and them realizing they can't have a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of champagne, a box of chocolates, some truffles, <laughs> because they know who sent it. They know how it got there. And I, he, I, he was teasing me the other day, he rang me up to tease me and said, my, you know, my family are so touched, we got the first five pages. And I said, God knows I had to pull it out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and what they have in their brains is if you've done 30 years in the Metropolitan Police, they don't know what wonderful stories they've got hidden that can be taken one way or another. But I said to John Sutherland, the lovely man, because you, you, look, you went to university, you're a very bright guy, you joined the police. There must have been a lot of people who thought, well, what about this chap? I mean, and so on. And he said, oh, well, the, the secret is to work hard, he said, and, and, and be light. I said, fine. But you must have had trouble. He said, oh, yes, I had one. Well, I'm coming in one day when I was a young constable, and the desk sergeant said, uh, Salon, come here. We've got someone in the cells in real trouble. Rush, rush, down to Boots, and get this dealt with. This, we need this immediately. So he gave him a piece of white paper, and off he went to Boots, and he gave it to the lease, charged to the front of the queue at Boots, and apologized. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's in uniform, of course. He hands it over to this lady behind the counter, he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we've got a problem. Can you please deal with this? Yes, she said. She opens the, uh, she opens the prescription and looks, and she turns around, and she gets a packet of condoms off the back of the shelf and gives it to him. And he goes red as a beetroot, <laughs> and he walks out looking ashamed, and then he reads the note which said, um, I am a young constable, and at last I've got a girlfriend, and I'm really not sure what to do next. Could you advise me? <laughs> And she behind the counter had obviously had one or two of these over the years <laughs> and gave him his packet of con and he said, and so stories like that, when you read them in the book, I have to rewrite them, of course, mm. I have to fit them in, but when you read them, I think, I believe, the reader says, that's, that Jeffrey's dragged that story out of him <laughs> and got it into, and there are many of, and we now have a tease because I've got four policemen advising me, including the wonderful Michelle Roycroft, Detective Sergeant Michelle Roycroft, 30 years wow. in the murder squad and drug squad. And she, she, she's wonderful. And they, they are wonderful. And they come out with these amazing stories. And it's a privilege to listen to them. 
Uh, and where they're now called, the joke now is that they're called hamper stories. Because <laughs> of this hamper, I say, okay, you've given me the facts on how many people were murdered in London, how many people were convicted, how many people went to jail, how many... Let's have a hamper story. And they now all know what I mean by a hamper story. <laughs> and Michel came up with another brilliant one, which you can't read in this book. It's not for two books. A brilliant one, she said... We'd arrested a man for murdering three people. Our problem was we couldn't find the bodies. And I said, well, uh, yes, well, we took him to court. We strangely won the case without the bodies. So I said, did you ever find the bodies? Yes, she said. He was burying them. He was burying them in a cemetery. <laughs> now you see, that's wow. marvelous. I I've turned that into 50 pages. Yeah, wow. <laughs> But she said, because she's now, Michelle's now understood what a hamper story is. Mm. And that's a hamper story. Um, but if you've had 30 years in the police force, your head is full of hamper stories. Well, my head is now full of slaughter stories. Well, and that's interesting. That's a word I didn't even know. And I no. wonder if people listening to this program have ever heard. But I didn't know a drugs den or drugs place was known in the trade as a slaughter. I didn't know that. So you see, there's an example of where they give you a fact. It's, we don't call it a drugs den, Jeffrey. We call it a slaughter. And so you have to kind of let the reader know that without saying, hey, I'm telling you. You sort of build it in and say, so you get one very naive young constable being told that it's a slaughter. Mm. So really that naive young constable is me. <laughs> because I am learning all these things and then uh, putting them into the story. I mean, the stories are mine. I'm the storyteller. Mm. But as you rightly pointed out, the public expects the facts to be right. Oh, yeah. Even down to the route of the now defunct 118 bus that winds its way down through South London. Yeah. And um, you've got to get, you'll get a thou I get a thousand letters if I get something wrong. Yeah. I get just saying, dear Jeffrey, it's not the 118, it's the 1172. Didn't you know that? No, I remember. Oh, Christ, no, I didn't know that. Sorry, madam. For some reason, I, I remember from that period of time that the, the 118 used to go down through Clapham Common and then on the way up across to Brixton. So when I read that in your book, I thought that rang a bell immediately and I thought, he knows his stuff, this Jeffrey. <laughs> well, now you've got to, on those th sort of things, you've got to do the research. I'm yeah. afraid you've got to put your head down and get on with it. Because uh, I made a terrible mistake in one of the Clifton Chronicles. We've corrected it in the first, only time will tell. Terrible mistake. I had my hero arrested in New York and the Miranda arrest warrant was read to him. And this is a particular way they arrest you in America, that they read out the Miranda rights. And I was 18 months too early. I, the letters mm. are still coming. We started out of the first edition. It's no <laughs> longer in the book. But the letters are still coming. And so you can't, so you can't make those mistakes. The public won't, they won't let you off the hook. That's true. Well, if anyone listening, um, this book, and I'm not saying because Jeffrey's here, um, some books I take ages to read. Some books I'll read 20 pages, put it down, and then come back to it a fortnight later. Uh, Nothing Ventured I read in a day and a half. Uh, and this new one that's coming out, Hidden in Plain Sight, um, I took a bit longer. I finished it in two days. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say, Jeffrey, it's really refreshing to read books, because the other one was still the same, but there's no bad language. No, you don't need it. There's no sizzling sex scenes, no, although there's a... Tell a story. Give them a story. Yeah. You don't need bad language and sex... I mean, John Sutherland and Michelle Roycroft and Robin, who've been working with me now on the first two, I've never heard them swear. Never heard them swear. No. And, and my readers don't want that. They want a story. They want a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they want to turn the page. If you've got to throw in some woman having her knickers pulled off under a fire <laughs> and then swear at her with effing and blinding, you, you can't tell a story. No. Tell a story. Yes. You can have a finger running up the, uh, up the leg, but, uh, but that's, that's it. It stops there. That's the it's allowed to go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great because I've got teenage children, and um, I'm quite happy to give them these books and say, Oh, that's nice. You want to read a good story. Nice. That's very nice. I had a 12-year-old boy in India. came up to me uh, at a meeting, and I, I thought, well, and he 
you've got, but just let me warn you, if you're in India, <clears throat> that the new generation of young Indians are so bright, you better be half awake. <laughs> so this 12-year-old comes up, and he's talking to me about Paths of Glory, the story of Mallory going to the top of Everest in, in the 1930s. Did he make it or didn't he make it? It's the real story. I don't have, you don't have to read Paths of Glory. The real story is amazing. Still, he's standing in front of me, age 12. He's three foot one. <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, and I want to know how much is true and how much isn't. And I said, well, I think about 80%. The research is done very seriously. He said, did you write the love letters or did Mallory write the love letters? I said, no, I wrote the love letters. So the ending is yours, yes. I said, the ending is mine. And he went through this, and, 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 and he was giving me a hard time at the age of 12. So I said, well, you know, I have, read other, I have written other books. And he said, yes, and I've read every one of them, thank you, sir, and left. He'd read everything by the age of 12. Now, there's two warnings here for you. You better watch that next generation of Indians. They are very bright <laughs> indeed. <laughs> you get a 12-year-old, be careful. <laughs> Well, I would urge anyone listening to this show um, to go out and buy Nothing Ventured, the first book. Um, a superb bit of preparation for the excellent Hidden in Plain Sight, which is coming out next Thursday, Jeffrey. Next Thursday, right? yes. And where's the best place for them to, uh, to get a copy? Well, W.H. Smith, I see, have made Nothing Ventured Book of the Week, so you can get it at a very reasonable price. Wow. Uh, uh, otherwise, you get it in, in, in any bookshop. Uh, and it's always fun to talk to someone who not only loves the game of cricket, but, uh, but reads the books as well. Yeah, my A.B. de Villiers story is rather sad, you know. Uh, many, many years ago, I'm just coming out of Lords and going back to my car, and this young man is chasing after me in white top and white so I assumed he was a cricketer. And he, and, he, and he reached me and he said, are you Jeffrey Archer? And I said, yes, I am. He said, oh, I love the books. I love the books. Can I have an autograph? And it's nice, of course, when a, one of the world's greatest cricketers asks for your autograph. <laughs> so I send him, I've sent, sent him a book always. So like you, he got hidden in plain sight a week ago. Still, many years ago, he was caught reading Cain and Abel on the, on, people may remember, South Africa were playing in England. He's captaining South Africa and he's sitting on, sitting out on, in Lords on the, on, on the pavilion, on the balcony, reading one of my books, and the public were giving him hell, because his side were out there batting it. <laughs> so, but cricketers, as I said, they, they have long journeys, they have long times away from home, so I get the strangest letter, from because they know I love my cricket. Mm. So I get the strangest letter from cricketers all over the world. What a delightful man, well, I've got you. Uh, Sangrakara is. Oh, yeah. What a fine man. I sat next to him uh, quite recently. Well, it was at an auction, so it must have been a year ago. <coughs> I was doing an auction for him and, and sat next to him, so was with him for two hours. What a class act. Well, I mean, I'll... not just one of the great batsmen of all time, one of the great captains of all time, but one of the great men. Yeah. I mean, what a class man. Well, I can... I can, I can um, uh... Square the circle, I think, if that's the right term, ah. between you, I, and Sangakara, because at a dinner well, at Lords, two great batsmen and you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a dinner at Lords, um, probably about ten years ago now, I think, uh, and it was for Murali's Foundation for Goodness. Yes, yes. And you were auctioneer that I night. I was the auctioneer that night. And you dragged um, dear old Kumar on stage, and he produced the shirt that he'd worn at Lords in the test the previous weekend. And um, you appealed to the audience to bid for it. <clears throat> and um, a lot of people got involved, and it was going up and up and up. And, you know, as, as we've talked about before, you're very good at getting people to support worthy causes and it was a great night and all the, the great Sri Lankan players were there and the, the great and the good of MCC and, and all the rest of it and um, the person that actually ended up paying and I'm, I'm not even going to begin to guess what it was uh, and came up and joined you and Mr Sangakar on stage was me Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> there, there we go Jeffrey it's been an absolute I've had to actually say that yeah. I, my, my poor dear wife Dame Mary, chairman of the Science Museum, truly great lady, stopped in the street the other day when she was getting out of a taxi by another lady. He said, oh, are you Dame Mary Archer? Yes, she said. Are you married to uh, that disgraceful Jeffrey Archer? And she said, yes, I am. Well, would you tell him that I require 
a, a, his diary for the next year uh, when he's doing auctions. And I said, she, Mary said, well, why do you require to know when he's doing auctions? I want to make absolutely sure my husband doesn't go to any auction. <laughs> Was the taxi driver called Danny? God bless him. <laughs> well spotted, sir. Yes. Well spotted. Yeah, you get yeah. a bonus mark for that. <laughs> You're half awake, but only half. <laughs> Jeffrey. We've had you on much longer than we uh, we asked you to appear, and as always, you've been absolutely fantastic company. And, You're very kind. Uh, um, really, really enjoyed talking to you, and um, many, many thanks. Um, we will make sure everyone that uh, follows 98 Not Out um, across our social media will be aware uh, and be in no doubt that Hidden in Plain Sight is available as of next Thursday from all good bookshops. And That's we strongly great. urge everyone... Oh, I'd much rather that you invited me to captain the England cricket team, but... Because <laughs> you wanted to captain the England cricket team. Tell the truth. Well, maybe you we'll... wanted to captain the England Maybe we'll... Only really half the people listening to this programme <laughs> want to captain the England cricket team. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, I'll let you go and get a glass of water and enjoy the evening. Uh, and take well, I'm care. Staying up. I, I'll go to bed early. I shall go to bed at nine tonight, but I'll be up at two to watch Trump versus Brighton. Yes. Uh, uh, Biden. I shall be up. I watched the first two. I watched the first and the vice presidential debate, and I shall be up at two o'clock in the morning to watch uh, the second presidential debate, uh, which is on at two o'clock in the morning. It's the last one, isn't it, before it's everyone goes one. to vote? Eleven days to go. My own belief is that Biden will win and win easily. Mm. Uh, coronavirus has killed Trump. It's finished him off. Uh, I may be wrong. I may be wrong. Uh, I am one of the world's experts on this subject. And I did say four years ago that he didn't have a hope of becoming the candidate. So he, <laughs> and I then went on to say for those who wanted expert advice on this, that he couldn't possibly become the president. So people realize they were in the presence of an expert on this particular <laughs> subject. And I'm saying again, he will be this time slaughtered. <laughs> Jeffrey, entertaining, engaging uh, and informative as always. We thank you so much for your time well, on 98 Not Out. Um, take care of yourself. Love to all you of the too. family and, uh, oh, thank you. And, thank and, uh, and to Ruth as well for organizing yes, yes, this. Indeed. And yes, um, I'll catch up with you soon. Hopefully we can, we can get together at Lords and uh, have a bottle of crew together. And, no, uh, Essex versus Somerset. <laughs> Somerset, first innings, 700. Essex, 11. Can we have some innings, Somerset, 700. <laughs> Essex, 10 for 9. <laughs> Rain stop, play, a draw. Well, if that's the case, we shall retire and have some cheddar cheese. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Indeed, sir. Your good health, sir. You too, sir. Take care. You too. Many, many thanks. Bye.